thanks a lot. Sorry, I thought my introduction was, was done there and then I kept going. <laughs> um, I want to start with um, a few lines from a poem. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud, of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory. The old lie, dulce et decorum est, pro patria moria. For, for those who don't know, it's a picture from Wilfred Owens of the horrific destruction and devastation and killing of World War I. And the final line said, or should be said with bitter anger uh, in Latin or in English, that it is sweet and honorable to die for your country. And it is an appropriate time to remind ourselves of the incredible capacity of the capitalist and imperialist system for that sort of barbaric destruction. Destruction which is utterly senseless from the point of view of the great majority uh, in our world. And a hundred years on, unfortunately, that capacity, with all the technological advances, misapplied and in the wrong hands, in the hands of the profiteers, is multiplied many times over. And I thought that was brought home very graphically last week in a report some of you might have seen from the World Wildlife Fund, which said that since 1970, 60% of the world's creatures have been made extinct. That's the equivalent, if that was humanity, of every single person in North America, in Latin America, in Africa, in Europe, and in China being taken off the face of the earth. The scientist who interpreted the report, or came up with the report, said that what we're facing is the sixth mass extinction event on the Earth. And it's the first extinction event caused by a species, caused by humanity. And of course that's, that's true, but it's an abstraction to call it humanity. It's not just humanity. It's not me and you and everybody here, ordinary people, who make the decisions about how our society is run, who make the decisions to cut down palm trees, who make the decisions to wrap bananas in plastic, who make the decisions to build our communities on the basis of private car usage. It's human society organized on the basis of profit, organized on the basis of the private ownership of the sources of wealth, of the means of production, it's human society organized on the basis of capitalism. And the conclusion was that we are the first generation to know we are destroying the planet and the last one that can do anything about it. And what that brought echoes of for me was what Engels wrote and then popularized by Rosa Luxemburg, the idea of socialism or barbarism. That it's, it's not some truism, it's not an abstract truth. It's an urgent call for action. Because that descent to barbarism that capitalism is engaged in is obviously embodied and we can see it in the person of Donald Trump, in Bolsonaro, in Brazil, in Duterte, in the Philippines. And recently in Ireland, in our own presidential election, which is largely a figurehead position, we had a, a warning of how that populist right can grow at home too. Where because of the very restrictive rules of the election, there's no left candidate. There's no left anti-establishment voice in the race. The entire establishment rode behind the incumbent, Michael D. Higgins, who was a former Labour left, but who was sold out many years ago, but still uses rhetoric about social justice and has a certain progressive veneer for a section of the population. And he walked away with the election. I mean, he got 57, 56% of the vote. But the main story of the election was the emergent emergence of our own mini pale reflection of Donald Trump, a guy called Peter Casey. And the parallels are striking. He's deeply inarticulate. 
He is a multi-millionaire. He gives out about, you know, spongers, but he doesn't pay any tax. And he's a TV presenter who made his name in a TV show about entrepreneurship uh, like The Apprentice. But he went from 1% in the opinion polls up to 23% in the final uh, vote. And he did it on the basis of engaging in racist anti-traveler rhetoric, which got an echo principally from the more backward sections of society, but also from a section of working class people who were alienated from the establishment. And it's a very sharp illustration for the topic we're discussing today about the need for a socialist political opposition to austerity, for the need for the socialist left to be present, to harness the anger, to harness the alienation, and to direct it upwards against the capitalist class who are responsible for the miseries our class faces, instead of allowing it to be diverted and directed downwards at other sections of the oppressed. And obviously the primary location of that struggle is in the workplaces, is in the communities, is in the colleges, and is on the streets. But elections, positions in council, positions in parliament, can be a very important auxiliary to those struggles as a powerful platform for the movements of our class, as I think we have demonstrated in Ireland over the last uh, whole number of, of years. We used, for example, the, an election, a by-election, and then a victory in the by-election and a position in Parliament to popularise and to agitate for the mass non-payment of water charges, which succeeded in getting 73% of people to refuse to pay and defeated that hated tax. We also used it to popularize and raise awareness about the accessibility of the abortion pill and to undermine in practice the repressive anti-abortion legislation that we had in Ireland and to link that to the need for a mass movement, to fight for a referendum, and then ultimately uh, to win that referendum again successfully. To act as a megaphone, to amplify the demands of workers who we represent, who we speak out for in the parliament. Recently, Lloyd's workers, who are overwhelmingly female, precarious workers, a strike against precarity, and currently the Glen Dimplex strike happening in the north. But also to put forward our socialist programme, to popularise our socialist programme, a socialist analysis. I had the opportunity to do that on Thursday with Mario Draghi, who is the head of the European Central Bank, was before the, the Finance Committee. And I was able to use that platform to challenge him on the role of the European Central Bank in representing the interests of the big bankers, of forcing the debts of those big bankers onto working class people right across the continent of Europe, and the undemocratic role of the European Central Bank in pushing those diktats of austerity, in removing governments, uh, as part of the model of authoritarian neoliberalism that makes up the European Union. He didn't like it, evidently, and that's why you had a headline in the Financial Times which referred to it as a fiery exchange. Um, but how we do that in Ireland is not invented by us. It's an attempt to apply the methods of the Bolsheviks in the Tsarist Duma, obviously in very different times, but also of our comrades of the militant MPs in Britain in different but less different times. And it underlines the essential nature of our, in our international. Marxism is based on the distillation of the experience of hundred years, hundreds of years of class struggle. And the more of those experiences, the more of those struggles that we can be close to, that we can learn from, the sharper not only our program is, which is essential, but also our strategy and our tactics for that struggle. And all of our struggles build on our comrades' struggles across the international. Our victory against the water charges was built upon the experience of your defeat of the poll tax, centrally the tactic of mass non-payment. We're now exploring the idea of an Amazon tax, uh, like the comrades in Seattle, because Amazon have moved in down the road from where I live, and they'll regret that. <laughs> um,
or the experience of the Liverpool struggle, where we recently had the privilege of having Tony Mulhern speak to us over Skype at our local branch in preparation for our local elections about using the councils as a focal point for a struggle, for mobilization, for resistance against austerity. Just to finish up, it's sometimes said now by those who are called capitalist realists or described as capitalist realists that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. And so it's, that's the equation of socialism or barbarism with socialism removed as an option. It's a fatalistic view, which is understandable for many people if you don't appreciate the power that working class people have to bring about the end of capitalism and to create a socialist world. And so just to finish, I'd ask people to think about what brought World War I to an end. It wasn't enlightened leaders convinced of the need for peace. It was working class people in extremely difficult circumstances making revolutions. It was the Russian Revolution in October 1917, shining a beacon of inspiration right across the world. It was the revolutionary movements right across Europe which followed that. And above all, it was the German Revolution which overthrew the Kaiser and which created, which would have created a German Soviet Republic if it wasn't for the betrayal of social democracy. Without that betrayal, or with a different strategy pursued by the Communist Party in the years that followed, we would be living in a very, very different world today. But the power of the working class was there for all to see 100 years ago, and it's there for all to see today. Our job is not just to imagine the end of capitalism, it's to help others imagine it in action and in program, and then to make it happen in our lifetimes, with the power of the working class allied to a revolutionary socialist program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul.